Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Dr. James Gill and you've joined me for another clinical skills lecture. Now, today we're going to be doing a, a clinical skill, an OSCE station with a slightly different form and that requires a, a bit of a public health warning. We're going to be looking at verification of death or confirming life has been extinguished in a patient. And thus, if you're dealing with the death of a family member, if this is a potential subject that's likely to upset you, please skip this video and come back to this learning point when you're in a position that you can do so without unduly troubling yourself. This is an important skill to be able to master at medical school, but if you're not in a position to be able to A, take in the information, and B, in a position that may result in anguish for yourself, please look after yourself first and foremost. And if need be, discuss with your medical school, they will be understanding about these things. So with that bit of housekeeping in mind, uh, we need to think about verifying death. Let's just put into context a few things, certainly in UK law. There is no requirement for a, uh, a doctor to be the one to verify death. There are paramedics, certain nurses and various uh, allied healthcare professionals who are able to verify death. There is also no requirement for um, a doctor to uh, view the body after death, nor for the doctor to report uh, a death has occurred. Now the reporting uh, that the death has occurred would fall to the family who will collect the death certificate. Now the doctor particularly the doctor who has last been involved in the patient's care, will be the one who is required to provide that death certificate. In the hospital, that is often the, uh, the, the junior members of the team of the consultant who has provided the most recent care, and in uh, general practice, so out in the community, that will normally be done for uh, the doctor that, again, has provided their last long-term care. Um, whilst it's not an issue for the doctor to report a death, it would be the responsibility of the doctor to report a death to the coroner. And that would normally happen when the cause of death needs investigating, i.e. the doctor wasn't able to adequately provide a cause of death on the death certificate. Now, it may be that that can be resolved with a discussion with the coroner about what the doctor wants to write, but it may be that the coroner has to take over and organise for a post-mortem to be able to confirm the cause of death. So with that in mind, I suppose we need to get on with what it is that it means to verify death. So if we're going to have to verify death, we really need to be knowledgeable as to what death means. So there are four features uh, that a patient will have in order to be confirmed as dead, life extinct. They must be apneic, i.e. no longer breathing. They must be unconscious, i.e. unresponsive. They must have an absence of circulation and that must be irreversible in nature. So as long as we've got all four of these features, then we can verify that death. And in the examination that we're going to go through now, we will show how to demonstrate those features. So whilst the verification of death is a clinical skill, there may be a strong emphasis on your communication skills as well when you go to verify the death. Because it's quite likely, if you've had a patient recently expire, there will be family members present. Even more so if this was an expected death. So whilst our approach to verification of the death itself is obviously going to follow the Academy of uh, Medical Royal Colleges, we need to have a way of uh, approaching those family members who may be in the room. I go about that by introducing myself as Dr. Gill and explaining that I'm there to verify the death. And at this point, I will offer those patients' uh, relatives to stay in the room if they wish to. Sometimes seeing the doctor work through the uh, confirmation of death can be cathartic and it can help that uh, family begin the process of acceptance and closure of that chapter of the patient's life. Conversely, it may be something that patients, uh, family members don't want to be present for, but they are more than happy for you to continue with them having left the room 
understanding what it is that you're there to do. So make sure that um, you're discussing with anybody else who may be there at that time. These are crucial communication skills, facets that can take a simple clinical skill to a much more significant personal level. So in this video, Athara has kindly agreed to provide his body once again for the examination. But unlike the normal examination, we can't introduce ourselves to the patient and ask them to confirm their name and date of birth. Instead, assuming we're talking about a verification in the hospital, we need to confirm with the ward staff the details of the patient that we've come to verify and make sure they agree with the person that we're there to see. Then we need to confirm the patient's identity on uh, their body, so uh, looking at their wristband to confirm their name, date of birth and hospital ID. Now, because we are there to verify, and have not verified yet, I actually approach all patients in this way by talking to them. And that can be useful with regard to, again, if you have family members in the room. Bear in mind, you are, again, there to verify the death. It hasn't been confirmed until you have completed your assessment, whether or not that's a doctor, an, uh, a nurse, a paramedic. So personally, I feel that going through these steps uh, increases the respect you're showing to the person you're there to verify and any family members that may be there as well. So with that in mind, let's get on with the examination and verification of death. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, can you hear me? So we've got no response from the patient. So we're going to confirm uh, looking at the patient's ID bracelet that we've got the right uh, patient and we confirm their name and date of birth. We then need to confirm once again that there's no response to voice. Mr. Johnson? Mr. Johnson, can you hear us? No. So we're going to start off with the pen torch. So we're going to check for pupil response, opening the pupil. And we're checking the pupil response. And when a patient has uh, died, we would expect the pupils to be fixed and dilated, not responsive to uh, the pen torch. We then need to confirm negative stimuli. So previously, we used to do sternal rubs. That is no longer the case now. Instead, we're going to provide supraorbital pressure. And again, we've got no response to pain nor voice here. So we definitely say that the patient is unconscious. Now we're going to check for one minute uh, the absence of a pulse. So you're going to use a large bore um, artery. So that's either going to be the carotid or the femoral pulse. And I like to do my 30 seconds on one side and then swap over to 30 seconds on the other. That way I know that there's no issues with a blockage at the carotid artery. Now it might seem a strange thing to say that there's no uh, looking with, for a blockage of the carotid artery. But bear in mind, we're verifying death. So this is an individual who may have very well had significant pathology. So making sure we've gone well over the 30 seconds. And swapping over to continue on to make sure there's absolutely no pulse. So we've confirmed that there is no pulse. We're then going to double check by using the stethoscope to listen for one minute for the lack of heart sounds.
So we've got no heart sounds at all. And then we want to listen for breath sounds and we're going to listen over both lungs, listening for 30 seconds on each lung. So no sounds on one lung, and on the second. So, so again, we've confirmed that there is no respiratory output either. Now, we don't check for bowel sounds as those can continue even after death as the bowel gas settles. The final thing that we do need to do is look visually over the clavicle and the top part of the chest and feel to make sure that there's no evidence that there may be a pacemaker in this area. So with all of those um, checked and all coming back negative, so we have confirmed absence of um, uh, breath sound, so we have apnea, we've got um, lack of circulation, which is uh, irreversible, and we have the patient who is unconscious, they're not responsive to verbal or pain, thus we can verify this patient is life extinct. And we need to document this in the notes, confirming their name, date of birth, the time of death and the date of death, as well as your details in case they need, anybody needs to contact you afterwards. So that completes our clinical examination, verifying death. We have confirmed the patient is apneic, they're no longer breathing. We've confirmed they are unconscious and unresponsive. We've confirmed that their pupils are fixed and unreactive to light, most likely dilated as well. We've confirmed they have an absent pulse and there's no evidence of a functioning circulatory system. And all of these are irreversible in nature. We'd want to make sure we document such in the notes, including the time of death and the date of death, as well as making sure that we've documented our um, details and contact the uh, number should anybody wish to contact us, the person who's verified the death. Now, I appreciate this has been a slightly unusual um, examination for the channel, but it is still important and something that can be uh, requested of students during a medical OSCE. Um, it's definitely something that all doctors will have to do, certainly in their foundation years. There are some additional skills that can be seen in the ITU setting if you're required to confirm brainstem death, but that is far beyond the scope of this video. So if you've got any questions or comments, please put them down below and we'll try to answer those for you. As ever, if this has been useful, please like the video and uh, consider sharing it. Well, thanks for watching this far. Take care and we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.